I don't seem to have any control over making the slides change. Mm -hmm. Can somebody show me how to make the slides change? This thing doesn't seem to do it. <laughs> Oh, this is a laser pointer, supposedly. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be working. Okay, all right. Let's see, um, there. This is working. All right, no, it works. Okay. Hit just the red button. There you go. All right. Okay, so this is the element of my talk. I'm going to first of all talk about the nature of quantum entanglement. Then I'm going to talk about the transactional interpretation and apply it to a few physical situations. Uh, <clears throat> then I'm going to talk about calculating uh, a transaction using a uh, Schrodinger wave mechanics with the transactional interpretation playing an active role, shall we say. And then I'm going to talk about two recent developments that uh, you might be interested in hearing about. So, uh, first of all, entanglement. Uh, Newtonian mechanics uh, have the situation in which you have a, a physical system which, when it breaks up, the uh, component particles, whoops. When it breaks up the com when it breaks up the component particles uh, have <clears throat> the different conserved variables like uh, energy and momentum and angular momentum parcel out to them immediately, and there's no necessity of, of, of any dependence. On the other hand, in quantum mechanics, we have a different situation because due to the uncertainty principle, the uh, <laughs> The uh, energy, the conserved quantities, energy, momentum, and angular momentum uh, <coughs> have indefinite values and they're not independent from one another. Uh, therefore, the system's properties are called, and this is called non locality. 
and using uh, Schrodinger's term, it means that the independent systems are entangled. Uh, so <clears throat> the <clears throat> so the, we have two sort of contradictory, seemingly contradictory things going on. First of all, we have these quantities that are conserved. And second, we have the uncertainty principle applying to them, which means that uh, they have indefinite values. And so this uh, leads to what we call the einstein godolsky rosen paradox. Einstein and godolsky rosen pointed out in the second half of their famous paper that the, this is a very strange situation, which Einstein thought was unphysical because the particles may be light years away and yet their wave functions still have this uh, interdependence. Uh, Schrodinger explained this by saying that the uh, component particles are entangled, meaning that uh, even when one fun function uh, are far, uh, even when the wave functions are far apart and out of speed of light contact, they continue to de depend on one another. Whoop. And in particular, they independent, they continue to depend on one another in such a way that the overall that that the conserved quantities are, are conserved. Uh, how is this behavior possible? Well, we can provide an answer using the transactional interpretation. Uh, as I said, when I was a graduate student, I was introduced to Wheeler and Feynman. Thought it was an interesting paper, and realized it was a very good way of calculating electrodynamics. And so I sort of put it in my uh, <coughs> file of things that are interesting, but perhaps very useful, and I uh, went on to other things. Uh, the Wheeler finding idea is basically that whenever a uh, <coughs> radiating system radiates in a retarded way, it also <coughs> radiates in advanced way with a certain phase. And then later on, down the road, uh, another particle uh, intercepts this uh, incoming wave by producing a canceling wave, and in the process of producing a can and therefore absorbing it, and in the process of producing a canceling wave, based on the advanced wave, which goes back to the source and cancels out, so that what's left seems to be just a connection between the two. The process, and my idea was. <laughs> Uh, as uh, which you can read about in my 2016 book, The Quantum Handshake, uh, it is briefly, briefly that this is what's going on in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanical formalism, we have in the wave mechanics formalism, we have all of these psi star functions and a wing of these stars. But what, but what formalism is telling us is that there's a handshake between the forward going uh, retarded waves. Between the forward and the and the backward and the advanced waves, the process looks like this. The first step is the emitter sends out an upper wave to the very solution, including the absorber. The absorber is then that confirmation wave. The, there's a bottom handshake, which then proceeds to the build up to a sort of standing wave across the base side. And conserve quantity of energy on that and transfer appropriately from the past to the future. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, this can be applied to a lot of quantum mechanical paradoxes. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is what's called the Einstein bubble paradox. Uh, and in the, uh, we have a source which is a, a, a radiation isotropically. Uh, according to quantum mechanics, the waves spread out. They reach a detector here, but no detection takes place. They reach two other detectors here and here, but no interaction takes place. Finally, it reaches two other detectors, and one of these absorbs the photon, and uh, the process is completed. I cite uh, the 19, at the 1927 Soviet as. How did this how does the photons wave function off, off at some distance know that it should disappear when the photons are detected? And how do you avoid having multiple photons <laughs> detected from one, one source emission? 
Niels, uh, you know, uh, the Berger Heisenberg was a the audience who said that a lot of us just don't understand quantum mechanics. The problem with this that the wave function is describing, the knowledge that's on the observer who's plot the system, and he sees the uh, detector detecting the system, he knows where the photon is, so it's no longer necessary to have this spread out wave function all over the place so it disappears other places. Uh, the term factual interpretation happens to differ, but it says that, <laughs> that uh, the, there's a handshake between the source of the detector, which is that which, uh, which uh, produces the detection. And the author way is the other direction to move and the other move outward. Um, interestingly, this, this leads to a testable prediction between the transactional interpretation and the knowledge base. Interpretation of the quantum mechanics. The uh, Copenhagen view post the Copenhagen view should what is that the waves must disappear because it must be observed. It knows where the wave, where the particle is. The transactional interpretation, the outgrown waves do not vanish because there are other ways going to other possible detectors and other detectors. That are far out, like this appear to be included as, as a possibility. It has to be reached by an offer wave, and so the offer waves have to be going. There's an experiment that I'll tell you about a little later, which is now going on. Well, it's not, not uh, published except in the an ABS song, uh, which seems to support the idea that the waves are still there after the detection. Um, Okay, uh, here's another situation where we apply the transaction interpretation. We, this is the famous Jones two slit experiment. If we put a part wave plate over one of the slits, then it's going to be in a different fashion. Higher we have the reflection pattern. The blade interferes, builds up part of the black particle. Uh, <coughs> Until it produces the whole um, uh, infrastructure in the first time, we need to find and call this the behavior of the central mystery of quantum mechanics. So, how does it work? Well, in the transaction interpretation, if there's no far away point there, what's going on is that the, uh, the, 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 the waves go through both slits, come over here to reach the detection, and and uh, <clears throat> uh, advanced waves then go in the reverse direction, going back to the bus that's confirming the transaction. And so we have a system of that. In the case of the uh, uh, water wave plate, uh, it may be like the system, the, we do not have a transaction forming that goes through this slit because it has the long polarization to be confirmed at the source. And so, therefore, only the transaction goes through this slit to, to the detector or goes through the lower slit to the detector before, but not both. And so, therefore, you get fraction times and like Chris time. Uh, here's another experiment Wheeler's delay choice experiment. Uh, we have a situation in which we have a two slit experiment, uh, and over here we have the type of plane signal one where we can. Observe the interference pattern. Uh, we also have the possibility that signal one can be yanked from the system. Behind it is the lens, which focuses both uh, the images of both slits on a detector plane over here. So we can either do a wave like uh, interference measurement from the, the, this way, or by pulling the this, this system out, we can do a which way measurement in which we can tell whether a given photon. Went through slip one and went through two slips, and we did it the appropriate image. Now, the wheel of the script is that you have a, you, you recruit a graduate student that has very fast reaction time, and you tell them to pull the, uh, the, uh, you to decide at this point after the particles have already gone through the slips to decide which one of these experiments to do, and you would randomly pull out this, uh, this thing if you wish. Uh, and so the question is, the problem, therefore, is that we have a, uh, a pro problem with, with um, 
making the decision of which measure to do after the quote that you've already gone to this just to guess that I'm looking at what we call an analogy going on. Um, the um, transaction that Herbert explains this because you basically have to form two different transactions. You form one kind of transaction, you have this system, you form the other transaction, and you have this system. And the transaction is after the decision is made in both cases. The transaction forms by the appropriate ways to only that would be for the transactions that were in the problem. Are uh, there's a modification of the wheeler uh, experiment by saying by putting the plane single one in, uh, he's doing a thing with pinholes rather than slits, and he put a plane here, measure whether what the interference pattern in place. Wires at the places of the of the uh, interference pattern minima along this point. <coughs> the wires are at six percent capacity, and, uh, and so then we uh, put the, look at the detectors behind what's behind the uh, behind the, the lens, and observe observe as slip two. The flux of particles that is going from the source to the to the detector over here. We can also do it for slip one, but let's focus on slip two and, uh, under very conditions. And so the question is, um, what fraction of the flux that you detect the two uh, is uh, blocked by the wires? And the possibilities are either six percent is blocked because the, the wires have six percent. Opacity or no, none of this block. Now, let me ask you, and now Neil Ford taught, taught us that there should be no interference when you do which way measurements and spoke. Let me ask the audience how many people think that 6% should be blocked? Raise their hand. How many think, think that 0% should be blocked? Raise their hand. Okay, then let's look at the results. Um, <clears throat> This is a uh, sort of the calibration measurement. You, whoops. This is the sort of the calibration measurement. You uh, put a, uh, you, you, there's no wires in two slips, and here's the image of detector number two as, as observed in, in, the, in a uh, CCD that's placed in the right place. Now we block one of the slits and just let it go through number two. And then we, this is a different flux now because you're blocking half of it. But uh, now we ask what fraction of the uh, light is intercepted in this situation. And indeed, we measure 6.6% plus or minus two. But when we take the blocker away and do the two slip measurement, we find that actually what, what, what was measured in this was the ratio was slightly negative, that uh, there was slightly more flux going through according to statistics. Than before, but, but it's essentially consistent with zero. So the point is that there was no, uh, and I would say I asked my uh, colleagues at the University of Washington the same uh, question um, when I first heard about this experiment. I got the same answer. Almost nobody thought that the, 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 the uh, zero that zero percent of the, the of the flux would be blocked when you put wires in the inter at the interference memo. So the conclusion is that wave-like interference is minimal or present even when a particle like which way measurement is being performed. Uh, and <clears throat> I should point out that that's consistent with the transactional interpretation because what's going on in the transactional interpretation is that you have uh, offer waves going from both slits, interfering with one another and causing interference in this region, even when only, only one of the offer waves, namely the one through slit two, is actually going to be confirmed. Okay, so moving along, this is the free, famous Friedman Clauser experiment. This is a fancy version of it, like the one done by Aspe, but it's basically the same experiment they did in 1972. Uh, we have an entangled two photon source. Whoops. We have an entangled two photon source, which is producing back-to-back uh, -back photons that uh, are uh, emitted by a, a, an S wave LA, uh, angular, angular and zero source. So that, that puts constraints on the polarization of the, uh, 
of the, photon, of the entangled photons are going both ways. And we observe that when we measure uh, with the two polarimeters aligned with uh, as, as they are in, in this, this diagram, that we, uh, we measure only uh, uh, linear polarizations that are both horizontal or both vertical. There's no mixed ones. If we tilt the polarimeter a little bit with an angle, then we see noise beginning to build up in which we got HV and VH photons growing. <clears throat> um, and from quantum mechanics, we know that this is, this would be governed by Malice's law. And so this is a, uh, this is a small angle approximation of Malice's law. Uh, <clears throat> so basically, uh, quantum mechanics says that the uh, amount, of, the, the rate at which the noise should grow should go like sigma squared or sigma this angle here. And Bell's theorem says that if you're dealing with uh, <coughs> particles that are uh, with uh, systems that are local, that, that must grow at zero. And so what's, what's measured is that uh, <coughs> the growth of, of the noise goes like the square of the angle rather than like an angle itself, or contradicting Bell's theorem, <coughs> indicating that there's some non locality going on in the quantum system. The transactional interpretation explains this as a sort of a V-shaped diagram in which the, this is time running vertically and space horizontally, in which the waves going outward go to the two detectors. The two, two detectors will respond by sending confirmation waves back and all the action goes on at the source here where it can only confirm the transactions if the if angular momentum is conserved and if the polarizations match. And so this is the way uh, one can <clears throat> guarantee that you observe the correlations that are appropriate for EPR and other similar kinds of measurements. Um, <clears throat> uh, now this brings us to the source of this confidence in interaction-free measurements. Uh, you're all familiar, presumably familiar with the uh, over and out here, so I won't go to really great detail about it. Basically, we have a mock standard and router, and with no nothing in the with nothing in nothing in the middle, uh, lower beam in this region, that all the photons go here because. Uh, we have one, two, three reflections going here, <laughs> and we have one, two, wait a minute, we have no reflection here, we have a reflection here, here, going here, and a reflection here, here, going here, so the same number of reflections for both paths, therefore they reinforce, but uh, going to the lower detector, we have only one reflection for the upper path, and we have three reflections for the lower pass coming 180 degrees out of phase and causing cancellation. Now, if we put a stopper in the way, then, uh, then the, the uh, photons on the lower path are blocked. Half the time, the uh, object that, uh, that we put in is hit by a photon, quarter of the time we get a detection here, and, and of interest is fourth of the time we get a detection here. And that tells us there's an object in the beam, even if there was, even if there, if no photons were actually interacting with the object. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, anti-action interpretation, um, which I, I explained this uh, interaction-free measurement in, um, at some length, and also included the um, the same of our theory, you know, and I'm going to mix with this letter of 2006. The transaction interpretation explains that by saying that yes, you're blocking the offer wave that would otherwise go uh, to, to this, this region and produce the interference, but the offer wave not there, the splitter works and since half of the photons coming down the path here and half of them there. So it's simply the missing the offer wave which is causing a problem. <clears throat> okay. Uh, <clears throat> Hardy has a had variation of the of the interaction measurement in which you put a sort of a double stirred Gerlach arrangement in the lower path in which a uh, particle doesn't have prepared in the uh, X plus X external plus phase is split and is and then D plus and D minus and then recombine. And then the question is you measure the 
the uh, state after the process, uh, what do you see? And the answer is that if uh, the if there is a particle in the Z1 location, the path is blocked, and so that allows uh, the photons in the Montana interferometer. Whoops. And lots of articles in the air bad to allow my center and proper to go to the D because there's no interference because of because of blockage. And so this explains how you can uh, make a produce uh, the uh, Z plus state. Uh, I mean you can produce the X uh, uh, plus state or X minus actually the X minus state, even though there was a uh, the photon has never actually interacted with the atom in the path. Uh, this is uh, the famous spinal light eraser experiment. We have a lithium iodide crystal uh, at this location. Uh, the uh, laser beam goes through the lithium iodide crystal, and it's sometimes like one in a million produces a pair of entangled photons which go this way or this way. The, the detectors represent here. But downstream of it, we put another mirror that bounces the laser back. And now the uh, uh, laser beam on this way can produce entangled pairs going here and here directly along the snap. And so we don't know which of the passes of the laser actually produce the photons. We get interference between these photons. We can uh, vary the position of this mirror here, and we see, see constructive interference. We can see the the detector going dark and light, dark and light as the thing is moved. And we insert a water wave plate at this location here. And now we have no interference at all. We move this and nothing happens. Uh, but if we then insert a 45 degree polarizer filter in the uh, in this arm here, and this arm could be moved way, way downstream so that everything else is gone afterwards. We can erase the uh, removal of, of the um, done by the water wave plate by and see interference again <clears throat> by this process. The transaction interpretation explains this by saying that uh, the handshakes are different depending on the conditions. Uh, and so, if we do, the, if we analyze the transitions, uh, the, the, uh, the transactions that form uh, in the three different conditions where, where the positions of the, of the polarizers, then you can easily uh, understand why it is we get this peculiar water race of behavior. Okay, finally, uh, there's the so called black hole information paradox. The problem is that. Uh, uh, if we have a Hawking radiation event, which is at the uh, near the event horizon of the black hole, then one of the, one of the photons goes into the black hole, uh, and the other one goes off into space. This one has carries negative energy, and so it actually cools the black hole a little bit. But the question is, these particles are the, the Hawking radiation are angled. So how do I? And it's not going to be what, what happens to the heart when it goes into the event horizon. What the quantum entanglement is be broken? How is that possible? Uh, various big time names in the string theory industry have produced rather absurd information, explanations of this. Um, these guys uh, have suggested that the uh, dis destruction of the, of the of the entanglement creates and it liberates energy, it's not exactly clear where the energy comes from, and it makes a firewall and destroys things right behind the event horizon. Uh, these guys suggested that there are wormholes that are connecting particles inside the event horizon, particles outside the event horizon, and preserving the entanglement that way. Uh, none of this is really necessary because nothing can escape wormholes except advanced waves. And advanced waves have no problem going backwards. Whoops. No, advanced waves have no problems going backwards to the event horizon of black hole coming out because of this divine reverse of a particle falling in. And so you can continue, you continue to have quantum, quantum handshakes uh, and so forth. So there is no black hole information. Very much. Okay. Uh, 
by doing what's fine. Oh boy, I'm running out. Okay, let me just say that um, that um, Carver Bean and I have used the uh, inspiration of the of the uh, <clears throat> transnational interpretation to uh, do a specific compilation using children and wind mechanics with a specific use of the advanced potentials uh, and so that you can track a uh, 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 a situation in which both on a stand up from one hydrogen atom to another, uh, and you can actually watch the transaction happening and the wave function collapsing. So you can actually see the collapse of the wave function because it's an emergency for the shooter. It also shows that uh, interactions along various paths can all uh, arrive in phase of the source and participated in forming the uh, the transfer. Um, but what I really wanted to talk about is a couple of other things. Uh, one of them is that uh, there's some evidence that uh, <clears throat> advanced slaves have actually been detected. Uh, this was tried by Bruce Parker some years ago and started by Wheeler Feynman. Uh, he uh, looked at he brought broadcast uh, um, so, uh, I guess it's lightning from his telescope, and um, the question of space would should be particularly unforming. We look for changes in the transmitter power that you, depending on whether it was a the beam or not, and he didn't see anything. Uh, <clears throat> later on, down the street from here, University of California, Irvine, Riley Newman, and his student, uh, Johnson, did an uh, experiment in which they put a detector downstream from a uh, microwave broadcasting system and they looked for advanced waves uh, by pulsing microwaves, looking for pulses that were running before the, the transmitting pulse came out. And they didn't see anything. Um, but um, <clears throat> there are some guys I have known. Um, names I can't remember who was trying to use electric means standard electrodynamics, uh, quantum electrodynamics to explain the behavior of uh, free electron lasers and the kind of they had to put advanced waves in their uh, their calculations or everything to work. And they also analyzed the new experiment and found that the problem was that the detector antenna that they were, that they were using was too big and then if you did it, reduce the size of the antenna by back to 20, they should be able to uh, see something. And so a uh, retiree from the uh, place in the party, the department was applied about uh, uh, set up in which he uh, actually brings to them observed in its waves and there's an online seven-page paper on this. Uh, uh, Julius Mady in, in upstate New York, whose brother was uh, one of the people who did the calculation I referred to, has confirmed these results. Neither of those is, these is published, but if you want to read about them, uh, I have a, 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 a column that I write for Analog Magazine, and these are online. Um, <laughs> if you look up Kramer, you know, if you search on Kramer alternate view, you should get into static call number 219. So maybe the advanced waves have been actually discovered. There seems to be that possibility. Maybe that's a really experience to support the idea, although I'm much bothered by the idea that they're actually detectable. Um, this is another experiment that I referred to earlier. Uh, Shabir Afshar, whose uh, experiment with the wires I talked about earlier, uh, a new experiment which is attempting to see whether the white front quantum wave function actually disappears once the detection is made. Uh, he had what's called a what he called the asymmetric monostandard parameter. Instead of putting the detector up here where the usual does, he puts it down here. So now both on the other hand go the goes way, way around the other corner and they go straight through. Uh, if you use a coherent source, however, and adjust the path length light, then uh, you still get the cancellation, the not same for cancellation can, can cause all of the detection to go there. Um, <clears throat> what he does then is put a couple of beats through in 
near the chalk, near the source, and <clears throat> detect uh, whether a photon uh, detected here or here. And it shows a situation in which there's a photon detected here, but not detected here, and observes whether there's um, <clears throat> whether there's interference, whether there's uh, equal splitting between these two, as there should be if the photon laser stop, or whether the uh, uh, preference for D2 still persists. And the, the problem with this experiment is you can use single photons and use pulses. And the way you do that is like turning the intensity of the source by down, which means you're going to count the for a long for months in order to make things work. But he uh, reported at the APS meeting preliminary results uh, <laughs> in which uh, he he seems to be seeing the interference of these so-called dark photon waves even after the detection at this point has taken place. And again, I write uh, and I wrote a wrote an analog. It's only published as an APS abstract, but I wrote an analog all about it, which is available at this address. Okay, so conclusions of the transaction interpretation provides a rational way of visualizing and understanding the mechanism behind the tangled analogy and wave function class. Uh, all interpretation of paradoxes and non classical objects, uh, external results, including the interaction of humanities, can be understood by one of the transactional interpretation. In my <coughs> 2016 book, the uh, uh, modern handshake, uh, chapter six is related to explaining about 36 of these otherwise mysterious uh, problems. Uh, <coughs> at least in some cases, uh, transaction formation and labs emerging from uh, application of improved change theory or wave mechanics can be calculated with advanced or handshake process of build and battle and just like that's the formation of over. And finally, uh, if one cannot choose a uh, preferred form interpretation based on experimental tests that eliminates some of them, one can at least choose the, the one that's uh, uh, that uh, explains the largest number of funny and the international profession with 36 of my book. That's an honor. And I would stop there. Uh, usually in physics, uh, we accept one interpretation of the other, one theory of the other, uh, based on the, whether uh, one of them can make a prediction which the others cannot, yeah. and then one goes to the lab and they uh, measure it. So your uh, transactional interpretation uh, does this predict something that the other uh, 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 views will not predict? Well, you know, okay. There's no answer for that, yes and no. Uh, the no answer is the interpretation is supposed to be describing what the formalism of quantum mechanics means, and it's the formalism that makes predictions. However, uh, as I pointed out in this uh, situation involving uh, the uh, Astro 2 experiment, this one. <clears throat> We are the transactional interpretation predicts that uh, one should see interference even after the particle is detected. And all knowledge based uh, interpretation of the mechanics do not. And so the, this is a possible prediction which you can distinguish between the two. Similarly, the transactional interpretation explains the other asteroid experiment, the, the wires of why there's, a six, why there's no 6% loss. A lot of other interpretations would fail to do that. So there are <clears throat> there are places where interpreting where experiments can touch experiments, interpretation can be touched by experiments, and uh, you can presumably look at some of them, but it's no easy way to believe the laboratory to see which interpretation quite matches for that. But but uh, suppose that I I'm not jumping at this interpretation, suppose I'm uh, Going through a, some more additional perspective of quantum mechanics, will I not be able to explain the, the results of this uh, after experiment? Um, 
I think the book will okay, but the taking knowledge certainly would fail. Well, the book they take knowledge interpretation certainly would fail if they would say that they you know, you know, the, 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 the type of article is way function must go away because it was the knowledge word uh, uncertainty that caused the way function be there in the first place. Um, so I'm actually if, if, if you can look at Wikipedia, there's a whole zoo of web mechanical interpretations, many, many of them. And you have to go through one by one and decide, try to decide what it has to say about this. I, I know what the transaction interpretation has to say about this experiment and the, the other experiments. I don't know what any random uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics that somebody else put up might say. I would have to say also that most of the uh, interpretations of quantum mechanics are aimed at explaining wave function collapse and don't have much to say about my locality and, 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 and the entanglement. And the transactional interpretation was invented to, to talk about entanglement and not locality. I think Paul's next. Yes. I'm trying to understand this other experiment with radio where you say potentially something is reflected back before the minute. I, I was just a little confused because I thought that whole thing about the advanced way. It's supposed to be the time reverse of the thing that's coming out, but I don't see how you do ever ever. Yeah, he says that's the downstream of the detector. He's also the, the radio wave, and he's downstream of the detector with some reliability, but not complete reliability. That there's also an observe um, the transit time um, uh, before the, the, the pulse went out. I guess my question is I would think that that would be opposed to what. Transactional interpretation would say because yeah, I mean, it's not. I, I'm not happy with it. I mean, doesn't the transactional? So if you think everything that happens, well, I mean, what it says is that there are incomplete transactions. So the the radio waves go out and, and they're more completely absorbed going off into space, and so there was a, a deficiency of absorption. Uh, and uh, this is basically what we look fine to say. And transactional interpretation sort of builds on what we look fine in this particular situation. Okay, yeah. David, you're next. Thanks. Um, could you go back to slide 14? Yeah. I think this might relate to Paul's question. So here, like you said, the Einstein, he was, he was kind of bothered by the, the wave function knowing to disappear at the places where the detector doesn't take. And then you say that if you, if you kind of look at this transactional handshake with standing wave, you, you can explain by why, why, why only one of them yeah. takes. But presumably before it takes, they're like these standing waves kind of semi-built up between all the other detectors and the source. Oh, the, the short. The question is, well, now there is a is the source can only verify the transaction from one possible point. But is there a standing way before it verifies it between all the other? That error thing is standing with the most of Okay, and that just randomly gets picked according to some. Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> if you, I understand this a little bit better, we have even some less than what the propagation is. That um, there are probably bad opinion in the universe is some busy plants and lots of ways going on the place. And uh, you could have animals that have a little bit of ground state or or excited state and questions that get there. And for sure, that's the school for a little bit of a ground state. What's the base for that with respect to the other one? It is the right phase. Then it's easy to make a transaction with the wrong phase and it isn't so. You can sort of explain your version from far away and write it. So that kind of just happened. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Can you go to slide 36, please? Yeah. So, so I'd like to understand this. So you say you, you, yeah, you, you select. So let, me, let, me, let me say something. You know, it's like I have it right or not. You sit in a single photon, at least so an attenuated coherent state in the source. You select the events where detector four does not fire, but detector one does fire. But it's not just it's two sort two emissions, one followed by another one. That's why we saw that we have these 
uh, particles from these single photons coming out in a string with a timing that's such that it's the difference between the transit time going this way and the transit time going that way. So that when particle one photon one goes around here and comes th to this point, the next photon in line has, can go this way and, uh, and arrive at the same time. Okay, so, so, so those are not, it's not a self interference effect, it's an interference between two different photons, yeah. is that right? Yes. Well, like I said, with a coherent optical source, you can, you can have a, um, this kind of uh, asymmetric mod center interferometer and have all the particles go, all of the flux go here because the coherent source sent waves this way and that way and they cancel here. So there's, it's, it's just the way a source coherence works. Yeah, so I, so I'd say if you put in a single, if you put in two single photon states in your interferometer, yeah. and you select on one of them then being the, 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 other not the bottom one, so, 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 so you remove the second one from the bottom rail, but you, you infer that the, the, the first one is going to the long rail. Right. Then then there's only one photon in the in the system, and so it can't interfere. Uh, the, 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 it cannot. Because it's, the, the the sister, it's, it's dark wave cannot in itself be detected because the its energy is already dissipated, but, but it can participate in uh, at the level of interfering with the other and basically steering the direction of the wave function by producing interference, which tends to cancel the detection of this form. Yeah, so I would say that that, that doesn't contradict the Copenhagen interpretation. I'd say that contradicts quantum mechanics. No. Why? Why, why, why do you say pumpkin? Because there's only one photon that's only going along the top rail. You can't well, interfere with. There's a wave going along the top rail. There's a wave going along the bottom wave rail. Even though this detection takes place, <laughs> because the, it's an offer wave. We have, from the point of view of the transaction interpretation, we have an offer wave that goes this way, meeting an offer wave from the, from the second uh, pulse. Coming this way and they and they can interfere. Right, but, um, but, but the but, second but pulse the energy that uh, the, the transaction that builds up goes back this way, and none of it goes that way to form a transaction along the photon line. Right, but the second photon is removed from the system by detection. Yes, but the waves that characterize the second photon are not removed. That's what this, that's what this experiment demonstrates. We do we know what the source of single photons is? Because it makes a big difference. Do we know what the source of single photons is? Because it makes a difference in what the, in what the results are. Well, perfect single photon. Well, particularly, let's say it's the source, let's say it's the boundary for well, Like I said, it's, it, this, is a, this is a very difficult experiment because uh, there's no source you can have that produces uh, both single photons like that. Well, you can get Harold's example for you to be a good example of it. But the thing is, a lot of times you could have a situation where you're as likely to get two photons in an early bin or two photons in a light, late bin or one photon in each bin. This is presuming that you have one photon in each bin, I think. But in most sources, you'd be equally likely to get two photons in an early bin or two in a late bin. And those are going to confuse the issue because you're going to see so something you're going to think that you have something going in. Could be not to not 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 spin. Not 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 the, 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 the assumption here is that you don't actually have one well, done in each bin. You wouldn't have any circuits. But the point is that the, the, the intensity dependent on the point of view is, is very different from the process. And so you crack the intensity variation uh, <laughs> that you would think the measuring of these sources and you can distinguish between accidental two photons. So these were actually down the coherent state? What? This was the coherent state then? No. It's not well, actually it's even trying to get so then yeah uh, one has to be very careful about the interpretation. Yeah, yeah. so I would say if you're a coherent state and you select on the, these the detection nets you actually talk about the code. Photons attracted to coherent states would be the correct one model description, not single photon states from vacuum states. Correct. You have, say, you, have, you have single photons attracted to coherent states. Well, correct. I, I think it's fine to also think in terms of the single photons you detect, but temptation here that might be leading us astray is to think of a single photon as being localized in time, even though we know that the source yeah. is coherent in long coherence time. 
So when you see a photon at some time, and you suddenly say that's photon two, therefore there shouldn't be a photon at the same time then. I think that's where the mistake comes in. No, but it's not, it's not, the other photon you're detecting is not from, uh, it's not that photon, it's just, but well, well, I think that photon, photon has modified the behavior of the other. I agree with the here, because it does take an appearance for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a coherent source of this. It has a you know, probably a hundred meter coherence length or something. So, right, it's a very narrow band coherent source, which means you have a superposition of remaining possible lines that put on the DNA, yeah. which means these pulses that you're chopping, you have a superposition of the same photon being two different pulses. So, the photon that arrives later, the actually material of the photon arriving earlier, is part of the same photon superposition. Oh, okay. So I think it's very important that the source is actually a, 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 a you like a of the single the hard to find out if it's going to be in the hallway. But anyway, if, if you want to know sources of uh, the, this, this information, right? and I think after I have some stuff online, that, uh, anyway, look at my, you know, my alter new column, or you know, list at the bottom, and uh, <laughs> what what's what information is available is, is referenced there. It is a tricky thing because you can get a mode lock pulse train to generate this type of you know coherence over a long distance. Uh, you know, but the problem is, as everyone's saying, how do you get a single photon into only single, only one? I think that's impossible because then uh, because then you no longer have the phase coherence between. Uh, the um, the cool bins, right? Yeah, and, and, uh, I remember asking him about that because, because obviously uh, doing the chopping modifies the coherence uh, situation. And, and he claimed that this causes you a slight reduction in the efficiency of experiment, but that's about all it does. Well, 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 the definition of a single photon is that it doesn't have things, right? So yeah. if you put a single photon in each one of these bins, then they can't, then you get a photon from one bin, but it's not based on the photon from other bins. Right? You, you have the more black pulse strain, you have coherence over the, the entire thing, but then you have a coherent distribution of photons throughout the train. And as Justin was saying, if you measure, you know, one in the beginning, and, you know, you actually have a a distribution, a distribution spread throughout the whole screen. Well, my was uh, so I'm doing a presentation now on uh, PSP2, and it's done with the with the CW, and uh, it's it's not really done so for the number as well, which might give you some way. But uh, it's, hey, I, I, I not that I'm the no. Actually, it's not going to matter if you get a coherent thing. It's good. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change. It doesn't change. Okay, other questions for Professor Kramer? Oh, wait, at the back? Yes, Daniel? Um, so I'm a little bothered by the um, idea that these two units in this facility says after the detection of the photon two. And that is also from the perspective of coherence and decoherence. Where here we should have a projective measurement which should uh, decohere the two photon state into a, or like the, the photon in detector one, photon two should no longer be correlated with photon one for a period of time, in according to the uh, original interpretation of quantum mechanics or quantum mechanics in general. But here it is. It's still it's the same for here. What does this, if the um, transaction interpretation is true, this should happen with all interactions. So what does the interaction, the um, transaction interpretation say about the coherence in general? So well, it says that after a, uh, the offer way go off in various directions, and someplace there's an uh, there, uh, there's a confirmation wave that comes back and forms a transaction. There may be confirmation waves and that relates at the same time, but only that one manages to come form the standing wave that sends transfer of energy momentum angle invoices and conservation laws. So uh, <clears throat> there are the other waves are out there according to the even after this detection from some close. 
Right, but shouldn't that, um, shouldn't the, the dark waves be present lead to um, possible correlation or interactions between two particles which should no longer be in a coherent state according to predictions of quantum mechanics you have found? Um, like here. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the <coughs> presence of a, of a wave. Um, yeah, I, I guess the answer is yes, but I don't I don't know the full implication of that. That's I guess what I'm asking, like what are all told uh, whether it's an important factor or it's a, my guess is it's not very important, but because of the plan and way it sort of out there, but yeah. Yeah, that's okay. All right, let's thank Jonathan right now.